Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. And I'll just start with a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, a uh, couple of events coming up. One is my workshop on the microbiome uh, and probiotics, which is scheduled for October 26th. Um, from uh, seven to 10. And one of the things I'm going to do in this workshop is that when I put out messages about the microbiome, everybody wants to know what probiotic do I buy and how do I know if it's a good one and all that sort of thing. So we'll take at least part of the time and we'll talk about that. Which product should you look for? How do you know if it's a good company? Um, we have a lot of people in different countries that watch my videos and the products vary from country to country. So some guidelines that I think would be helpful. What problem are you trying to solve? And then how do you figure out what probiotic is best, that kind of thing. So that one's filling up. And so if you're planning to do that, I would tell you to do it right away so that uh, enroll right away so that you don't end up listening to the recording if you wanna ask questions, okay? Um, the second thing, is um, we're doing, we're offering a special, get six months of our smoothie ingredients, um, the superfood smoothie mix and the flax and gr food grade green tea and brews yeast and all the goodies that go into the smoothie, which I have every day for breakfast. And you get to participate in a free weekend uh, boot camp with me uh, that it'll be October 29th from seven to 9.30-ish, and then maybe 10 o'clock, because we have a lot to talk about. And then Saturday morning for two hours and Saturday afternoon for three hours. And we're gonna talk about um, things like how to protect yourself from colds and flu and um, other germs and viruses, um, debunking myths about um, who's vulnerable and what should you do to protect yourself and all that sort of thing. If you get sick, what do you do? Um, and then dealing with the, all the chaos in the world from you know staying happy and centered and you know ways to do that time management uh, people a lot of times want to do a lot of things including exercise and eat right and finding the time to do it is an issue and finding time to do other things that you want to do is an issue too living a happy life is not just working and eating and exercising believe me there's a lot more to it than that and then getting in shape for winter i guess um one of the things I've observed is that there's always some kind of spring program where you're going to get in shape after a winter of putting on weight because you wore bulky clothes and you weren't outside and all that sort of thing. So how about we get in shape for the winter so that you come out at the end of the winter ready for spring and putting on a bathing suit and shorts and getting out in the sun and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and then of course our conference is November 12th through 14. And if you can't join us here in Columbus because seats are limited anyway, you can watch it remote um, and, and or watch it on a video platform. We'll put all the lectures there. So, uh, and, and you can do both. So you can come to the conference and get the video platform. You can watch it remote and get the video platform. Uh, all options open. Um, right now, the way that people are getting to come in person, because we're having it at our office uh, in our own little conference center, is if somebody decides to stay home and watch remote, because a lot of people buy their tickets a year in advance and thought that maybe things would be different right now, and they aren't uh, entirely. So um, somebody says, I'm gonna stay home. That opens up a spot for somebody to um, have a live in the office with our guest speakers, Peter McCullough, Scott Atlas, Peter Bregan, um, and a whole lot of other people that you want to hear from, I'm sure. Okay, so if you want to get your name on that list of people that might get a ticket, um, just uh, send me an email at pampopper at msn.com if any of this stuff is interesting to you. All right, on Tuesdays, what I've been doing is I've been talking about cancer prevention because we are running this two-month campaign right now, um, defeat uh, prostate cancer, defeat breast cancer. Um, prostate cancer month is September and breast cancer month is October. So we're gonna do this through the end of October. We started right after Labor Day in September. And if you sign our pledge card to take better care of yourself, you get a $100 certificate. Uh, toward our courses. If you get 25 other people to sign, you get another $100 certificate. So you can use that to take some of our fabulous courses. And the list is posted at wellnessfarmhealth.com of the courses that you can choose from. So today I want to focus on a big misunderstood issue, which is alcohol and cancer. 
All right. Now, to be clear, I'm not a teetotaler. I'm not suggesting that you be a teetotaler either. I mean, you might be, and it's fine. There's no mandate to drink alcohol. The problem isn't having some. The problem is quantity. All right. And um, and so, in spite of the fact that um, and, and people often and alcohol companies often promote alcohol as if you drink it, you're going to get health benefit, right? But that's not true. Um, alcohol intake is a significant uh, risk factor for cancer. It's not if you are like me, the type of person that has some wine at a wine tasting and on my birthday and that kind of thing. But if you're one of these people's having cocktails every day, um, I'm going to give you some, or your binge drinker, I'm going to give you some data that I think will give you some things to think about. Um, alcohol currently accounts for about 4% of new cancer cases each year and about 3.2% and 3.7% of all cancer deaths in the United States. Um, one analysis concluded that, quote, higher, uh, higher consumption increases risk, but there is no safe threshold for alcohol and cancer risk. Another study concluded that while higher levels of consumption increase the risk, an average of just one and a half drinks per day or less accounted for 30% of all alcohol-related cancer deaths. So again, having, some, having a cocktail now and then, treating alcohol as a treat, that's not the problem. The problem is when people start um, drinking daily uh, or several times a week or binge drinking. According to the International Agency for Research on Cancer, alcohol consumption can increase the risk of oral, pharynx, larynx, esophageal, breast, and liver cancers. There are close to 100 studies showing that alcohol increases the risk of breast cancer and the risk increases even at low levels of intake. Just as the tobacco companies have worked really, really hard to disguise health risks associated with smoking, the alcohol industry works equally hard to deceive the public about the risks associated with drinking. A recent analysis showed that most information from alcohol industry organizations and posted on websites maintained by the industry significantly misrepresent the findings of studies that have looked at the relationship between drinking alcohol and cancer. Also like the tobacco companies, the alcohol industry works through front organizations that position alcoholic beverage makers as being socially responsible. This prevents policymakers from taking more regulatory actions and protects sales and profits. Now, unlike the tobacco industry, alcohol producers have been able to maintain their relationship with government, health departments, and the World Health Organization. Representatives regularly attend meetings during which alcohol is discussed and take part in developing alcohol-related public policies, disseminating information about alcohol to the public, and even educating school children about alcohol. This type of collaboration is clearly unethical since partnership with local, national, and international health agencies lends credibility to industry campaigns which serve to mislead the public. And the fact that these agencies allow or even invite this to take place is very, very questionable. Additionally, the producers use numerous strategies such as social media posts and funding think tanks that give the appearance of being independent. A research group analyzed information about alcohol and cancer that was drawn from the Global Alcohol Producers website and reports posted from September through December of 2016 and from 26 alcohol producers websites. Five websites flatly denied that there was any connection between alcohol and cancer risks. 12 out of 20 reported that increased risk of cancer due to alcohol only affects people who are heavy drinkers or binge drinkers. Some alcohol makers claim that consuming alcohol could be protective and reduce cancer risk, particularly for smokers. All of those statements are false. The researchers reported that the industry uses three main strategies for misleading the public. First of all, denial, just claiming there's no relationship between drinking and cancer or that moderate drinkers are not at risk. And a moderate drinker is somebody who drinks regularly, several times a week. In some instances, the industry just avoids mentioning cancer at all in its communications and hopes that nobody asks the question. Distortion, claiming that risks are only associated with certain drinking patterns and claiming protective effects when there are none, or implying that since knowledge of the causal mechanism is incomplete, warnings about alcohol are unwarranted and there's a lack of expert consensus. And that's really, really not true. And then distraction, pointing to a long list of other risk factors for cancer. One other thing I'm gonna to mention to you, because this is such a confusing issue, a lot of the studies that have been done by the alcohol industry showing that alcohol is protective 
have used um, have used a, the study design to manipulate the outcome. So what they've done is they'll take a daily, you know, one person a day drinker and, um, and compare the outcomes of a social, what they call a social drinker to former drinkers. Okay, well, what's the problem with using former drinkers as the comparator? The, the, why do people stop drinking? Because they're alcoholic, or they're very unhealthy by the time they stop, or people who have serious disease and then decide to do a lot of things to improve their health, and one of those things might be giving up alcohol. We've seen that happen a lot of times in the 27 years we've been in business. There's only one study that I ever found that actually compared social drinkers to never drinkers. People like the South, many people who are Seventh-day Adventists don't touch alcohol. Many religions don't permit the consumption of alcohol. And in, in that particular study, the, um, there was no benefit whatsoever for drinking at any age, except for women my age. And it was a tiny, tiny um, advantage. And that was two drinks a month or less. Okay. So once again, um, I'm certainly not cons you know, saying that you should never have alcohol. And I've never said, my gosh, a piece of cake is going to kill you and cookies are going to kill you and all this sort of thing. The problem is that in our culture, in westernized cultures, these things that would normally be holiday celebration foods and special occasion foods and beverages have now just snuck into the daily fare. And that's where you end up with problems. So um, if you want to avoid uh, breast and prostate cancer, really take a look at your alcohol intake and, and ratchet it down to special occasions and holidays and, and that sort of thing. And you can still enjoy a nice glass of wine or champagne or whatever it is that you like. Um, but just remember, it's a treat. It's the same as cupcakes. They're treats. I don't care if they're vegan or not. They're still treats and um, not to be confused with lunch and dinner. All right. Well, I hope that that's helpful. And once again, if you want to get involved with our Defeat Breast and Prostate Cancer campaign, send me an email at pampopper at msn.com. Thank you for watching.